Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. I'm going to run through a couple things very quickly. Just to kind of get our bearings reoriented once again. Galatians chapter 2. To me, this issue is very near and dear to my heart. Um, every one of us at some point in our life was lied to. Every one of us at some point in our life was misled. We were deceived. And um, I grew up in church and um, the three different churches that I can remember going to, uh, I knew that, you know, knowing the churches, I knew that they were preaching the truth. But still, the devil finds a way to mislead every one of us. He finds a way to lie to us. And this is one of the issues that I was, that I was lied to about. Galatians chapter 2, uh, verse 4, very quickly. And that because of false brethren, unawares, brought in, who came in privily to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, that they might bring us into bondage. Remember, the purpose of the gospel is to set us free. It's to set us free, not just from other religious lies, but it's to set us free from sin and a lot of other things. So anyway, and the purpose then of the devil's deception is to bring us back into bondage. To whom we gave place by subjection, no, not for an hour, that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. But of these who seem to be somewhat, whatsoever they were, it maketh no matter to me. God accepteth no man's person. For they who seem to be somewhat in conference, adding nothing to me. But contrary wise, when they saw that the gospel of the uncircumcision was committed unto me, as the gospel of the circumcision was unto Peter. And uh, anyway, let me move on from there. Uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1, There were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you. I'm moving through some of this fast because we've already covered these verses, but I'm leading up to something. Jude, beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, the way one person is saved is the same way another person is saved. Amen. We're all, the ground is level at Calvary. It was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints, for there are certain men crept in unawares uh, who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men. That means they're not godly men. They're the opposite of godly men. They are ungodly. They do not have God in their life. They are not saved. They are wolves. Wolves are not sheep. Amen? Sheep are not wolves. Sheep don't eat other sheep. Okay? So who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness, denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, so I've got a dividing line on the screen. And I'm going to show you how... I was deceived and how, what is at the core of most, if not all, of the deceptions that there are out there. And it comes in the form of from what source a Bible is translated from. That's the core of it. I bought, when we were up uh, visiting Matthew, um, we didn't so much visit Matthews, we did go shopping, which is what Lisa likes to do. So we went to this one Goodwill store, and there was the New World Translation. New World Translation is the Jehovah's Witness Bible. Now, Charles Taze Russell read the Bible, didn't like what it said, so he decided that it should all be changed. So he, once his organization took off and they got the guys to do it, then they basically went through and whatever they didn't like in the Bible, they just retranslated it to whatever they wanted it to say. It turns out 
that the Jehovah's Witness New World Translation uses the exact same Greek text as does the New International Version, the New American Standard, the Holman Christian Standard. In fact, what I'm saying is every other English translation of the Bible uses the exact same Greek text as the New World Translation does. So the lies that are in one Bible could very well be the lies that you'll see in other Bibles. All right. So I have to make sure that I'm saying the same side to you. On the left side is the Textus Receptus. That's the Greek text. In fact, let me show it to you like this. Okay. On the left side, the Textus Receptus, from where the King James was translated, follows a line of manuscripts of over 5,000 Greek texts. Now, what I did was I looked for a picture on the internet of 5,000 books. So there, on the left side, is what 5,000 books would look like. Okay? Now, imagine if you had a library of 5,000 books and every one of those books were the same book. So basically, you had a library of 5,000 books where they all said exactly the same thing. Okay? They came from different locations and came from different dates. But you really liked this book and you went about collecting different versions of this book and they all said the exact same thing. That's what you have when you have the Textus Receptus, the, the Greek manuscript that the King James was translated from has 5,000 sources that all agree the same and say the same thing. So, if you picked one book out of that library and read it, and you picked another book out of that library and read it, you're going, they say the exact same thing. Okay? Even though they were written at different times, published in different locations, they're all saying the same thing. Over 5,000 partial or complete New Testaments where the Greek text all says almost identical, the same exact thing. Then on the right-hand side, you have the Greek text Novum Testamentum Gratium, the 28th edition, where... Their source is from only two Greek texts. Or I'll say primarily, I'll say it correctly, primarily two Greek texts. Okay? And those two Greek texts, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus Greek text, written about 300 AD. Well, let me just show you this. Just in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Sinaiticus and the Vaticanus disagree with each other over 3,000 times. 3,000 different, different verses just between those two documents, just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They disagree with each other 3,000 plus times. Okay? So, if you were going to pick a Bible, would you pick one that had 5,000 different copies that were all saying the exact same thing, or one that was based upon two Greek manuscripts where they didn't like each other 3,000 times just in the, the, four, the first four books of the New Testament are the most important ones. 
They're the ones who tell us who Jesus was, what he did, and how he did it. Okay? That's, that's the point I'm making to you here, is illustrating for you that when it comes to the manuscript line the King James comes from, the agreement is impeccable. Now, if you were to get 5,000 Christians in the, in the same room and ask them, do you all agree on this one point of doctrine? <laughs> what would that you get? <laughs> no, you would get a big argument. And we'd all divide up denominations, which is exactly what we've done. But, for there to be 5,000 plus different Greek manuscripts, where they were all saying almost the identical thing that's just that's a miracle it's a miracle okay you have it illustrated in two places in the bible deuteronomy 32 you can turn there john chapter 15 you can turn there or you can just let me read it to you deuteronomy 32 verse 32 for their vine, this is Moses talking to Israel. God's talking through Moses. Moses is explaining something. For their vine, and he's talking about all the enemies of Israel. Their vine is the vine of Sodom. And the fields of Gomorrah. So we all know what Sodom and Gomorrah was all about, right? Right? So if you have a vine that God says is the vine of Sodom, what kind of fruit is that vine going to produce? And he says, their grapes are all grapes of gall. Their clusters are bitter. Their wine, then, the juice from those grapes, is the poison of dragons, the cruel venom of asps. In other words, the poison that comes out of the mouth of the serpent is the wine that you get from the vine of Sodom. You're going to get poison. You're not going to get truth. You're going to get poison. Whereas, here's John 15, and here's the opposite vine. I am, Jesus said, I am the true vine. Now, in God's version of the word truth, God's version of the word truth is, I've never lied I've never told a lie. I will never tell a lie. It is impossible for me to lie. If it comes out of my mouth, it is truth. Doesn't, doesn't matter if Bill Nye, the science guy, agrees with it or not. I said I created it in six days. He's a liar. And everybody else is a liar. Okay? I'm a liar. Every now and then, I don't say things that are true. I don't like it. But this is why I'm not God, and none of you are either, and why we have to have something that's going to tell us the truth every single time. And that's God's word. Let God be true, and every man a liar. Okay? So Jesus said, Abide in me, and I in you, as the br branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. So it, it has a lot to do with the fruit. If, if the vine is true, the fruit of that vine is going to be true. Because we know from other places in the Bible that a corrupt tree cannot bring forth good fruit. And a good tree cannot bring forth corrupt fruit so if the vine is true the fruit and the wine of that vine is going to be true it's going to be 100 percent true whereas the vine of sodom and and the bible's giving you he's the bible's teaching you these two different manuscript lines and everybody agrees Everybody in all of Christian scholarship agrees that the Textus Receptus is not the same Greek New Testament as the Novum Testamentum Grace, Grecia, whatever. It's not the same 
as the new Greek text that all the other Bibles come from. Everybody agrees on that. There is, there is nobody who is saying, oh, they're the same Greek text. Nobody's saying that. So, if you have one Greek text that has 5,000 different sources that all pretty much say the same thing, that Greek text is not going to be the same as the Greek text whose two primary sources don't even agree 3,000 times just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Okay? So, false brethren unawares brought in. False teachers among you. Certain men crept in unawares. The... The Nes it's called the Nestle Aland Greek text. And I'm going to teach you a little bit about why it's called after those two guys' names. Eberhard Nestle is a guy who back in the 1800s started taking these two different Sinaiticus and Vaticanus Greek texts and using them to formulate a different Greek text that was different than the traditional Textus Receptus that the King James came from. So in the 1800s, you already started having two different lines of manuscripts. And I'm telling you, the lie that I believed at one point was the lie that the Greek text that you see up on the screen was the better text. I was taught that in two different Bible colleges, and I believed it. So the New International Version, the English Standard Version, the New American Standard Version, the Christian Standard Version, the New Living Translation, the New English Translation, the American Standard Version, the New King James Version, and the Message Bible. All of those, practically every modern tra translation of the English Bible, comes from that. The King James comes from a different line of manuscripts. And again, there's no argument. Uh, if, you, if you get Bible college and seminary scholars and preachers from all over the world, they will tell you the same thing I'm telling you, that the King James does not agree with the new translations and the Greek text that those translations come from does not agree with the Greek text that the King James comes from. They don't agree with each other. They don't belong together. One says one, another says another. So, here is the men who help put together this new Greek text. Now remember, I'm going to go back to this picture here. The Textus Receptus, which is where the King James New Testament comes from, with its 5,000 plus witnesses, okay, has not been altered, has not been corrected, and it has not been changed since... Uh, a guy by the name of Erasmus, who put it together in the late 1500s, has not been altered since then. This Nesalaland, this blue Greek New Testament, is in its 28th edition. Which means, since first time it rolled out, back in the 1800s, it has been altered 28 times now. It's gone through revision. The scholars, the, the scholars look at all the Greek texts and they say, you know what? We think that verse needs to be changed. So they change it. And then they look at another one. You know what? That verse. Uh, the, the, we have new Greek texts that say, says it this way. So they alter that verse. So every, I don't know how many years, but every 10, 15, 20, 30 years, something like that, they roll out a new Greek text that is different than the one that came out before. And here's what I'll tell you. 
The New International Version came out in 1973. And it's based upon this Greek text. But it's based upon the Greek text that was around in 1973. So the New International Version that came out in 1973 does not match the New International Version that's out now. It doesn't match it in several places. So, the King James, 1611, been out since 1611. You know how many times it's been changed since 1611? Zero. Has not been altered in over 400 years. My grandfather, my mother's dad, was a Southern Baptist preacher. I never knew him. He died when my, when my mom was five. But I heard he was a Southern Baptist preacher. You know what Bible he preached out of? The exact same one that his grandson's preaching out of. Exact same Bible. Okay, people who got saved 200 years ago got saved from the same Bible that you got saved from. Same Bible. They read the same Bible. They believed the same Bible. This lady here from Korea, who English is a second language to her, reads a King James Bible. Okay, so... When I say false brethren unawares brought in, false teachers among you, certain men crept in unawares, you're looking at a table full of them. Because I'm going to tell you who some of these guys are. Who, who took the Greek text and made it completely different than the Greek text that the church has had for 1800 years. Kurt Aland is a German scholar. Um, to his credit, he belonged to a group of churches that did not go along with Adolf Hitler's Nazi churches, to his credit. But here's some things that Kurt Aland, and it's called the Nessel Aland Greek text. He's the leader and was the chairman of the committee. He is the one of the guys sitting here at this place right here. Uh, second, the second from your right is Kurt Alon. It's his committee. And this is from the late, I think this is 1988, 1989, somewhere around in there. So this is a recent, relatively recent photograph. Kurt Alon said this, when we observe this, assuming that the writings which we about which we are speaking, really came from their alleged authors. Now, what he's saying is, he doesn't believe that Paul wrote Philippians, or that James wrote the book of James, or John wrote the Gospel of John. He doesn't believe that. He said, when we observe this, assuming that the writings about which we are speaking really came from their alleged authors, it almost appears as if Jesus were a mere phantom and that the real theological power lay not with him, but with the apostles and with the earthly church. Well, so what he said was, I'm not even sure if Jesus was real, but we know the apostles believed him to be real, so therefore... He also said, if the epistles were really written by the apostles whose names they bear and by the people who were closest to Jesus, then the real question arises, was there really a Jesus? Can Jesus really have lived if the writings of his closest companions were filled with so little of his reality, so little in them of the reality of the historical Jesus? That's Kurt Aland. Bruce Metzger, he is sitting uh, next to Kurt. Well, the guy third from the third from your left. Uh, Bruce Metzger, I had to read some of his books in Bible college. Books of Moses were derived from a matrix of myth, legend, and history. In other words, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Bruce Metzger did not believe that Moses wrote those books. 
He said they were derived from a matrix of myth, legend, and history, which appeared as early as the time of David and Solomon, but that later in modified form became part of Scripture. He does not believe that Moses wrote the five books of Moses. He does not believe that. Okay? So here's what John said. Here's, well, in fact, here's what Jesus said in the book of John. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. He did not believe Moses. So he does not believe Moses. Jesus said, if you don't believe Moses, you don't believe me. Had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? Okay? So that's, that's the two. Those two guys were Protestants who shaped the New Testament. Here's Metzger with Pope Paul being blessed by Pope Paul. Here's Bruce Metzger with Pope John Paul II being blessed by Pope John. Thank you for your work, Bruce Metzger. Here's Kurt Alon with both popes being rewarded with an audience from the Pope. Now, it's obvious that this church and the Pope's church are not the same church. It never will be. But these are the guys. Oh, I left. Well, here the Jesuit superior general said, we don't really know what Jesus really said. Uh, I got to move on. This, this guy right here. Here's what I want you to notice. This guy's wearing a white shirt and a tie, 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 a white shirt and a tie. This guy is not wearing a white shirt and tie. Now, if you, I don't really care about wearing a tie. If I'd had my rather, sometimes I'd rather not wear a tie. That's not the point I'm making. The point I'm making is, what is he wearing? His name is Carlos Martini. He's a Jesuit priest who sat in on this committee to make sure that the Greek New Testament that they all formed could be read by both Protestants and Catholics alike. In other words, it was giving the Catholic Church's seal of approval on that Greek text. And here's what, he was uh, chairman of the Textual Criticism Committee, Committee at the Pontifical Biblical Institute. And the Pontifical Biblical Institute, here's what the Roman Pontifical Biblical Commission said in 1964 about us. The fundamentalist approach is dangerous for it is attractive to people who look to the Bible for ready answers to the problems of life. It can deceive these people, offering them interpretations that are pious but illusory. In other words, they're an illusion. Instead of telling them that the Bible does not contain an immediate answer to each and every problem. I think it does. Without saying as much in so many words, fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. It injects into life a false certitude for it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are in fact its human limitations. So guys like this guy who sat on this committee in fact, this guy, this guy, this guy, we have quotations from those three guys. And they do not believe that the Bible that they were working on was actually the word of God. The infallible, inerrant word of God. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe it. They didn't believe a word of it. They mocked, they ridiculed. They criticized, but they didn't believe it. Okay, now let me read John 12. If any man hear my words and believe not, 
I judge him not, for I came not to judge the world, but to save the world. He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my words hath one that judgeth him, the word that I have spoken. The same shall judge him at the last day. John 14, Jesus answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words. He will do what? And my father will love him. So apparently these guys were more interested in the acceptance of the popish holy father than they were the real holy father. And we will come unto him and make our abode with him. He that loveth me not keepeth not my sayings. And the word which ye hear is not mine, but the Father's which sent me. So where did your Bible come from? Your Bible came from God himself. But these guys, ah, these guys, they didn't believe it came from God. They believe it came from myth, from legend, from man. And they're the ones who put together this, but not this. Our Bible is based on this. Every other modern translation is based upon this. So you decide. Was Paul, we're reading here that Paul said, false brethren were brought in unawares. Jude said, certain men crept in unawares. Peter said, there shall be false teachers among you. By who, way of whom the way of truth will be evil spoken of. So were those men right? Have false teachers crept in? unawares bookstores are full of both these bibles and the thousands of books at christian bookstores that derive from those bibles they're full of them and this is what is making so does it surprise us anymore when a church in our county will say in no uncertain terms we accept people who have or are participating in homosexual marriages we accept them into our churches so what's the fruit of the vine of Sodom Sodom that's how you can tell that it's there and what it's been doing yes David Yeah. Yeah. And if there's anything that I want this book to do, is change me. I didn't like how I was. Still don't like how I am. I need change. I don't need to change the Bible. I need the Bible to change me. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. We're not arrogant about this. Because, Father, I know where I used to be. And I'm not proud that I'm different. I'm humbled that you allowed me to know the truth. Father, I pray that you'd bless the word and help us to understand that the devil will come at us multiple forms. Ways to get at us. Ways to lie to us ways to destroy us and put us back in bondage so father I just ask your blessing on your word we love you in jesus name and all of god's people said amen by the way we're gonna i'm gonna preach a message i'm keep preaching what i've been preaching the last couple sundays it's the word that makes us free from the chains of bondage amen